Welcome back. This is part two of the ECG Axis tutorial. In part one, we talked about this right here. This was uh, Eindhoven's triangle. Okay, and now in part two, we're going to talk about ventricular depolarization and where we actually get our electrical axis from. So the QRS axis, or the mean vector, is what we're talking about here. Mean, that's just another fancy word for average. Okay, and what we're talking about is the wave of depolarization within the ventricles. Here's what I mean. When your ventricles depolarize, it, it doesn't all happen at once, right? It's rather quickly, but first your septum depolarizes, then your apex, then the lateral walls, then your high lateral wall. And that's kind of understood, right? It, it, it kind of moves in a wave fashion. And it's all these cardiac vectors, um, thousands if not millions. And, and we need to average that out to get an electrical picture. So your, your QRS axis is simply just the average of all of this ventricular depolarization. And whatever direction that average is going is our mean vector, okay? So when you're looking at lead two, if you have normal conduction, such as this, lead two's positive electrode somewhere down here, you would get a good upright QRS complex. Because we know that depending on what lead you're looking at, uh, whatever po the positive electrode of that lead is, if the wave of depolarization is moving towards that electrode, so if your QRS axis or your mean vector is moving towards that electrode, then you'll get a good upright QRS complex or an upright wave. And if it's moving away, you get a negative wave, okay? And if it's perpendicular, this would be perpendicular, okay, to this electrode. If it's perpendicular to the positive electrode, perpendicular simply, you know, think of an upside down T, this would be your lead, and this would be the wave of the polarization right there. That's perpendicular, and that'll give you an equiphasic, equiphasic uh, QRS complex. And if it's some combination of these two, it'll give you, you know, a biphasic, but maybe it's more positive on one side, more negative on the other, okay? Uh, so th that's kind of some intuition of, as how we get these waves, these swiggly lines on that EKG paper. So, using Eindhoven's triangle, all right, and, and I've kind of superimposed the wave of depolarization, the, the mean vector over there. Um, we know why we look at lead two, because it's normally going in the direction of lead two, or lead two's positive electrode, very well. We also know this is why we look at lead one, and lead one should be, uh, you know, upright, because it's going more towards lead, one, lead one's positive electrode than lead one's negative electrode. And in electrocardiography, uh, the leads are equal as long as they are parallel. I know that might sound confusing. Uh, Tom Boothley uses the example of physics. Two vectors are, are equal as long as they're parallel, so if you, you know, understand physics, that might help you. But in electrocardiography, two leads are equal as long as they're parallel. So lead one, if you think about where you put your electrodes on a patient, some people put them on the wrists, some pe people put them up on the shoulders uh, of a patient to get lead one. Well, your heart is nowhere near that, right? Your heart is well below your shoulders. So how is it that lead one sees any kind of electrical activity that's going on down here in your heart, right? Well, because it, it looks at it in this sort of parallel fashion. And it will pick up that, that wave of depolarization, that mean electrical vector, uh, based on that. So knowing that, that you can do that, you can kind of move all of your leads to make them intersect in the middle See, we've dragged lead one down here. So lead one was up here and we've dragged it down. Lead two was out here and we've kind of dragged it over. See, we've moved lead two in this way and we've moved lead three in this way. And we make them intersect right here in the middle because we know that that's how they kind of look at the heart's electrical activity. You could do the same thing with the augmented leads. Okay, these are all your augmented leads. Augmented voltage or vectors of the right arm left arm and foot, all right? You could do the same thing. Those are all equal in, in that sense. And you can intersect them in the middle. And since you can do that, you add the two together and you get this funny looking diagram that we were talking about before. This is the hexaxial diagram or hexaxial reference system. And that's where we get our angles from uh, when we're talking about axis deviation. And, and if I give you an angle, and if I say your QRS axis is at about uh, I don't know, 95 degrees. Well, you know that's right about here um, on this diagram. And that means that lead AVF should have the most upright 
QRS complexes because AVF's positive electrodes down here. I've put the positive symbols and negative uh, symbols on the, uh, the hexaxial diagram here so you know that if we're going towards the positive electrode in a lead, you should get an upright QRS complex. We know that. It's kind of intuition, right? So if I'm going this way, if I'm going this way with my QRS axis, how do you think it'll look in lead three? Well, it's going completely away from the positive electrode in lead three, so it would probably be negative, almost completely negative. In AVL, it's, it has its positive electrode over here, so it would probably be mostly positive, okay? What about an AVR? How would AVR look? Well, if this is our QRS axis right here, make it bold and big so you can see what I'm talking about here. If that's our QRS axis right here, AVR is pretty much perpendicular. And we said that perpendicular leads will be equiphasic like that. They'll, they'll have a negative aspect and a positive aspect. Okay, so that's the understanding of this hexaxial reference system. And knowing that, you already know so much now. Just by looking at a 12 lead, you'll be able to pick up on which direction the mean axis is kind of going, depending on what leads it's positive in, what leads are negative, and what leads are equiphasic or biphasic. And why is that important? Well, axis deviation. We kind of dis discussed this in the, the first part. We have different types of axis deviation depending on where the, the QRS axis is. So this would be normal if the QRS axis was heading in that direction. This would be right axis deviation if it was heading in this direction, left axis deviation in that direction, and then extreme right axis deviation, no man's land, if we were heading in that direction. It's kind of interesting and intuitive because if you look back here, you can kind of separate this into quadrants, okay? Let me use a different color. Separate this into quadrants here. And by doing that, now we know that this is normal. Normal. This is less left axis deviation up here, right axis deviation over here, and then extreme right axis deviation over here. You kind of see where this is going, and you know that soon we're going to be looking at which leads are positive and which leads are negative to discover where we are on this here. And it's important because if you look over here, there's all sorts of different pathologies that cause axis deviation. So that's it for part two. I know it was kind of quick. Um, we're going to get into how to actually discover the, the QRS axis on a 12 lead EKG. I just want to give you some intuition uh, using Tom Boothley's uh, process of axis determination and how he kind of teaches it on ems12e.com because that's been very effective for me when I was learning uh, axis determination. So I feel that you'll kind of understand it a little bit better having the intuition of where it comes from. So I'll see you in part three uh, where we start talking about 12 leads a little bit more.